So the, 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 the episode of today is about your uh, newsletter of this week, week four. Um, yes. Uh, entitled Why Human Rights Are a Nightmare in the ESG World. Um, I would like to provide you know, like to provide you know a quick summary of what's happening around the world, the status, um, and yeah. everything in between. It's really important because we mentioned that you know in the in the in the in the in the previous session we had um, you know that um, everything sounds like corrupted and fake news almost. Um, but today, uh, I think that everything that's related to ASG is impacting somehow employees, but not only employees, but also uh, users and customers. And, yes. and I'm happy to explore that with you, you know, along, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes every week. Um, and, and, and have your viewers, um, please provide us with some tips. Thank you. About what's going on <laughs> in the world, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you very much. So maybe the starting point is that to just to, to explain to the people that will listen to this. I mean, I uh, consume huge amounts of information in the ESG industry and have been doing so for the last 20 years. So after some time, you start sort of a sequencing in some of the information to understand, get better picture where the development is taking place. So if you, in order to see are, are these different businesses sectors improving their performance, you know, what can we see? And in this last newsletter, what I am trying to address is that human rights, that this is a sort of a fundamental in democratic societies, is also the, the, the reference point for many investors and, and managers around the world. And I've been looking at the way how this, this you know, universal concept of human rights is actually implemented, both in the products and in also how the, the, the asset managers and, and, and funds and investors are communicating. And it's quite obvious, if you look at it from that perspective, you can and that's the reason why I'm writing about it as a nightmare, because if you were really following all the references that you made in your on your web page to human rights, global compact and all of these other things, you would most likely have big difficulties to invest because we don't live in that kind of a world. And uh, there are a lot of um, dilemmas that investors need to face. And what I'm trying to address in this newsletter is this duality in European approach to specifically towards Russia, given the security situation we have right now, and trying to explore a bit how, how complex this is and also show a bit um, how difficult it is that we, on the one hand, uh, are very firm on our support to the human rights dissidents and you know political dissidents in different countries. On the other side, we are still continuing doing business with these countries, and not even that, but we are increasing the business doing in these countries. So, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just trying to point out that it is a complex area, and uh, it's also very complex for the customers and clients to understand this, uh, because usually they are delivered with a. Uh, almost like a formalia things where, you know, uh, yes, we respect human rights. It's integrated part in the way how we assess companies and countries. But in the same time, you, when you start digging into this, you realize how complex it is. And, and, and also, uh, I think what I'm trying to point at is the fact that we should not misuse human rights concept in, in that way because it has its own... Um, it stands on its own legs and it should be respected for it and it's very important and by sort of a lightly using human rights in our ESG analysis or sustainable investments we actually you know watering down the concept that is universally accepted I mean all around the world and it's it is a problem and I don't think it's right um, and aside of that I'm pointing out in the fact that European Union is speaking with a with a twisted tongue, you have on one side, you have, you know, sanctions that imposed on Russian Federation on oil extraction, <laughs> but not on gas. And if you probably know a bit about geology, you'd also know where there's oil, there is gas. So we are not. Uh, I know that there is a, an interesting uh, format to earn assets on one side. And uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly and you see i mean and it's also sort of a if you put you see industry in the context of of economic development or transition towards sustainable future uh, it's sort of a the EC industry claims to a certain extent uh, yeah. it's right to impact countries and companies but in the same time you have to see the limits and the limits are actually based on the underlying economical dynamics germany is one example as i'm writing in a in a 
Yeah. Exactly. In a newsletter, you know, you have the, the, the German car companies using gas from Russia, regarded as sustainable, but at the same time, we have a sanctions against Russia. So it's like sort of how do you get this to work in, in your concept? So more clarity, and I think transparency is very important. And I think also what I allude to very often is to say that let's call a, a shovel a shovel, you know, a spade a spade. Let's let's don't pretend about all these nice SDG frameworks and so on. And just before this program, I just uh, saw one new uh, thing that came out um, recently is that uh, uh, the World uh, Benchmark Alliance has then done a study over sustainable uh, social sustainability of a thousand companies, only 1% that actually can fulfill that. So that gives you a bit of a feeling that we need to we need to take this tempo of marketing and PR down and focus on where can we actually make a difference? What can we do? You know? Yeah, I, unfortunately, uh, I'm not sure that we're going to achieve that level of um, trust and transparency as we, as we wish it could be. But um, my, my point here is that I think that, you know, we're getting into the worst every week more and more. And, and, and the point here is that I think that we need to admit that there are shades of a difference in our, with ESGs, of course, but overall, you know, regarding the human rights or whatever is related to value and principles of human life on earth. And I think that um, when you speak about overusing natural um, assets and the environment, that provides us with, you know, gas, oil. I think that when you spoke earlier about, you know, limitations and exploration from big countries and industries, well, they don't have any limitations because it's natural. And that's the biosphere that's pay, that pays, you know, us with resources. Yes. And that, that, that here, I think the limitation is here. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that the global population can go against uh, these practices, but what we can do for sure is to set up, you know, regulations and policies, but I'm not even sure that they're going to respect that because they're going to always find alternative, as you mentioned. So maybe the thing here is, you know, the global movement is like, at, at that point, maybe utopian, but on yeah. the other side, if we don't start it, it's never going to happen. No, it's always, I mean, the question is, when is the right time when you need the, the right time is now, it's quite obvious it's now, and we need to start and I completely agree with you with the fact that I think re increased regulation, it's most likely the, 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 the response that we need in so many different aspects of this, but the question is, then you have the concept of national state and then you have a concept of global capital. And how do you sort of combine these two things and how do you make sure that you know global financial industry is really. Uh, following the regulation on biodiversity or human rights and so on, so it's 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 not complex it's very complex, but I think what. What we can do is to do uh, to be more transparent, saying that, for instance, I mean, um, not assigning the ESG industry this um, white knight, uh, you know, uh, solution provider, but more like, OK, uh, what is the human rights core of your fund? Uh, it is, I don't know, from one to ten, it's uh, it's two. Uh, and of course it is because it's reflecting the world we're in. And so what are the targets? How do you actually improve that? How do you move things forward? How do you hold, hold companies accountable and so on and so on? But this requires much work, many hands on the deck and much more transparency. I I think our biggest problem is it's it's lack of you know if you take somebody in Israel or in Sweden or in Switzerland or any other place uh, and you ask them so how much do you actually understand how this is done people have very limited knowledge they get they eat what they are served and you know if it's aligned with their in, with their inherent I mean domestic values where they are then that's fine and that's okay but if it's not alien cortex <laughs> yeah that's yeah. all. I mean, it's like, and it's, you're so right when mentioning, you know, earlier today I published the cost of the crisis, that that's something like irrefutable right now. Yeah. And the, and, the, and the eventual end of what's happening right now as a role uh, during this crisis is that we're going to, we're going to stay without anything, without any resources, of course, because I don't believe that, you know, we're going to be capable to renew something on a cycle um, or any type of production, a mass production 
if we want to look at what's happening with the agriculture and the food industry, yes. it's becoming really complicated. And that relies on human rights, as you mentioned. And yeah. you know, mainly what we would like to see is one different types of plants, not only, you know, coming up from rich people from the US or from yeah. Russia, but at least something that can be consistent on, on a certain level of, I mean, um, availability and, and realistically um, feasible. So that's, that's something that, you know, instead of always focusing on assets that we can put, you know, in the balance sheet to move them, you know, and, and prove that we are not damaging, you know, any type of environment, we're not there. Uh, I don't, yeah, think, but... I don't think, you know, the global population is looking at what's happening, you know, on the asset side. And that, no, 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 and, I don't and, think and, they and do. And that's no. a fallacy. That's a total fallacy. That's what's going on, you know, everywhere. It is, it is. But you also have to bear in mind that if we were to price in, let's say, the cost of biodiversity to certain business models, and if that was to be reflected on the stock markets, they will probably go busted because the price, the, 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 the cost they will acquire to, to run their business will be so high. So, of course, there are many parties that would like to keep the things as they are. But it, what is quite obvious is that the world, to some extent is moving into a different direction and because we are more and more in a mode of crisis security crisis human rights you know climate all these different things and now we need to start um, trying to develop new systems because the systems that we have are not serving us anymore so now we need to start thinking in a system change and that will take us time and that's what some people are saying that, you know, maybe we don't have a time, but I don't think we have a choice. So we have to do it. And then in parallel, some of these solutions, I mean, let me give you an example of Norway. I mean, Norway is a country that has uh, the most uh, percentage of electric cars uh, in the world, uh, but and it has the same uh, CO2 footprint as Sweden, uh, with with the fact that it's uh, the, the biggest footprint is it's hidden because they're exporting oil and gas all over the world, one of the biggest. Uh, so. You know, if you go to Norway and ask people, I think most of people would say it's very, they are very, very environmentally friendly. I mean, they are doing what they can, but at the same time, they're doing something else that is contributing to emissions all over the world. So it's a systemic issue. So we need to start addressing systemic issues and with systemic that the state has a responsibility and how far can it go in terms of involvement and responsibility, like from the population? The national state uh, and, and, and national states have difficulties to, and you could, you could have seen this during this COVID thing, uh, to, to, to manage global crisis. I mean, yeah. because what happens, the only thing they can do is that they can shut down the borders and keep the control over the territory they hold uh, in principle and cooperate to some extent. But it, in, in during this COVID, if you look at the European Union, the countries were not cooperating. They were just closing down and, you know, shutting their populations out and, and trying to find the solutions that they are not maybe uh, as efficient as they could be. So it is a complex.